Hello, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Andy Bradley. I'm one of the directors at uh, Delta E. Thank you for joining our webinar this morning um, or this afternoon, depending on, on the time zone that you're in. Um, I'll be joined today by a couple of my colleagues. Um, Alex, do you want to say hello? Hi everyone. Um, looking forward to have this webinar today with you. Um, I'm Alex, I'm the research manager of the New Energy Business Model Service at Delta Energy and Environment, uh, based in Delta EE Paris office. Thanks, Alex, and also by uh, Jennifer. Yep, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer, I'm head of products at Delta EE, and, and I'm here to ask Alex some interesting and difficult questions um, throughout this webinar. So get ready, Alex. <laughs> I'm ready. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer. And uh, I'm just to complete. I'm Andy Bradley. On you can see him on the right-hand side. It's a photo from a few years ago, I, I suspect, but uh, I feel as I've aged a bit over the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the three of us are really pleased to, to welcome you to the webinar today. I can see uh, people still joining actually, and the, the numbers are going up. So perhaps we we'll give a few seconds more for for people to join. So. We'll be um, running the webinar for about 40 minutes is, is usually the amount, of, the amount of time that we aim for. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see uh, a sort of a, a dialogue box and you can submit questions uh, to us as we go through. Feel free to, to send your questions through. We'll try and pick some of those up as we uh, go through the webinar or, or at the end of the webinar. Um, if you have any uh, IT problems, I think that probably the best thing to do is to uh, email uh, info at delta e uh, hyphen e dot com. Um, uh, but I think I can see people still joining. So, but the numbers are slowing down now. So, uh, yeah, I think we'll just start the webinar now, Alex. I think. Um, so, welcome everyone to the webinar today. We're going to be presenting um, some slides uh, based on our state of the market. Uh, report that we've uh, just published to subscribers um, over the last weeks. It's an annual exercise that we do as part of our, our business model uh, research uh, service um, and the structure of the webinar today. You can see um, after a short introduction for myself, I hand over to Alix and she will take uh, the audience through the kind of method methodology of the research and then some of the key messages from our uh, state of the market outlook, market and outlook. Um, and also we've asked in the last couple of weeks for questions from attendees today. So we've we've picked uh, three questions just to address those in the, the final part of the webinar. Uh, for any subscribers on the call, you can access the full report and data by clicking on that link and logging into our subscription website. Uh, obviously today we're just sharing some, some selected highlights and ex extracts from the research. Um, if uh, for non subscribers on the call today, well, you can visit uh, that link, our, our new energy business models page on our website, and you can get lots more information about this, uh, the research that we do under this uh, service. So, in terms of uh, just the headline message, uh, perhaps the previous slide, I mean, just to make one comment, um, you know, our conclusion from the, the state of the market report that we've published this summer is that actually we see last year really as a, a turning point for new energy and you know, market growth is quicker than we expected um, in 2020 and actually we we believe we've entered a period of sustained growth so you know perhaps to summarize that as as an s-curve there and new energy is at the bottom of the s-curve so we're actually entering the period when there's going to be sustained uh, rapid growth in this market and we believe that through the research we've been doing we've got a lot of proof points and evidence to to back up that statement so it's a really exciting time actually to be in this market is our is our key conclusion conclusion lots of growth opportunities and lots of lots of different parts of the market to to uh, to go after so just moving forward uh, just briefly for those who don't know delta e um, we're a specialized research consulting company you know everything we do relates to this transition from from the old energy world to the new energy world that you you can see characterized on 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 the slide there i'm sure many of those themes are familiar to to many people in the audience and clearly that those trends are, are driving the need for um, well, lots of things really, but you know the energy system is changing. So where are the new valuable pools emerging, you know, uh, end users' needs and wants are evolving. 
obviously we need to develop new business models and strategies to respond to that, which require new propositions and services. Um, and the digitalization in particular is leading to a, a, an industry convergence um, and a, you know, major changes in the competitive landscape. So all of those things really are, are, the, are the core of our work at uh, Delta E and you know, everything we do is related to helping our clients who are mainly the energy suppliers and manufacturers, energy network operators, investors, many different types of stakeholders to navigate really that transition. So that's in a, in a nutshell, that's what we do as a business. So when it comes to business models, clearly there's a huge amount of complexity in the market, new technologies, new business models. You know, here's a, a word cloud which just captures some of the, the phrases, the buzzwords that, that are being banded around. So it's, it's characterized by complexity. Um, at the moment and our research that we're doing on the, the new energy business model service is really about sim simplifying that complexity. So if you move on to the next slide, Alix, thank you. Um, just this summarizes you know, what subscribers get from the research. You know, on the left, you know, deliverables, reports, databases, viewpoints, case studies, company profiles, access to the research team, you know, the typical deliverables that um, you get from a Delta E research service. You know, the focus of this research is really summarized on the right hand side these are these are the types of questions um, that we uh, focus on um, innovative propositions coming to the market what's gaining traction in the market where's the money where's the money to be made and the value from these business models you know what does this mean for incumbents and, and new entrants where are the opportunities for them and how are end customers responding so really we're focusing on the commercial and business aspects of, of this innovation and you can see this state of the market report we're talking about today is really you know a summary of, of many of the different uh, parts of research we do on business models um, managed by Alex as the service manager so uh, the quick summary for me introduction so Alex I'll just hand over to, to you now perhaps to take us through the, the main part of the presentation yes thanks Sandy for this introduction and I'll start with another introduction but really focusing on the, the state of uh, the market reports. Um, and I'd like to give some definitions, especially about what we mean by new energy, because at Delta uh, EE, we have a quite specific definition of that term. And by new energy, we mean behind the meter assets in the position to upstream generation, for instance, um, which means that we cover business models that are mainly customer centric, uh, rather innovative, um, not focusing on commodity side really. And um, we follow a lot of servitization uh, because it's a key part of what uh, we consider as being new energy. Um, so as Andy explained briefly, the state of the market report uh, gives an annual overview of the transition from new to old energy. And to uh, give that uh, analysis, our analysts investigate um, energy actor strategy market activities um, and many other um, indicators um, from the past year. And the conclusion of, of our report are supported by quantitative analysis as well. Um, so we evaluate consumer spends in key product area, which are listed here, uh, namely immobility, heat, uh, smart buildings, and behind the meter generation and storage. And in each area, we will cover a specific range of new, new energy technologies and services, um, such as electric vehicles, heat pumps, smart thermostat, home energy management, and uh, many more that we think are uh, key for the new energy transition. So jumping into the main conclusion uh, of this report, what we've seen in 2020 um, is the new energy market transitioning faster than ever. So Andy has mentioned this S-curve um, feature. Uh, we've seen a lot of new proposition launches and an increasing customer spend on new energy product and services. So without surprise, uh, we found out that the e-mobility market was probably the most active one with an impressive growth rate of customer spend, uh, more than 100%, as you can see. Um, but customers spent on heating and small buildings, although they are progressing more slowly, are still um, growing and we expect a double digit growth from next year onward. And Alex, just on the, the numbers here, obviously e-mobility is streaks ahead at the moment. 
um, you know, is that is that the reality? Is it is it really that far ahead? Will the other areas gain? Um, yeah, it is. Um, we've seen a booming uh, electric vehicle market last year. Um, so this growth is totally representative of the dynamic of the markets. Uh, there are also a few reasons that can explain why growth rates uh, in the smart building and the new heating markets are quite low last year. And I think the COVID-19 um, outbreak is one of these reasons because installers could not get access to homes. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the, the EV market is, is really a poor market and uh, that makes it quite special in new energy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, it's probably just worth commenting on the four definitions again. You know, what is smart buildings? You know, what, what are we including within our definition, our market sizing for smart buildings for new heating, e-mobility and solar and storage? Just to, to clarify exactly what, what it is we're talking about when we're talking about customer spend in these areas. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in smart buildings, we're going to consider anything that is related to smart control and optimization of energy flows within buildings. Um, so for instance, we'll look at smart thermostat, um, thermostatic valves, um, connected um, controls, um, and home energy management, of course, uh, but also added value services such as um, remote diagnostic and that sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, New heating will consider um, electrif electrified heating, uh, such as heat pumps, but also connected uh, direct heating. Um, also, everything around uh, heat contracts, such as heat as a service, um, and that sort of thing. In e-mobility, we will consider um, electric vehicle sales, of course, uh, which explains also well why this market is so big. Um, we also consider charge points and charging infrastructure or charging services. And finally, in the behind the meter solar and storage market, we'll consider customer spend on um, uh, PV panels, uh, batteries, um, um, and everything that comes with those, so inverters um, and services for solar and storage. Mm -hmm. And for this four product area, we will not only cover residential customer, but also um, custom, um, commercial and industrial customers. So we haven't shown the splits here for different types of customer, but it includes, for example, residential and B2B customers. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. And just on e-mobility, there might be some questions coming in on this, but does, are we we're including the vehicle as well as the charging infrastructure in the definition of consumer spend for e-mobility? Yeah, we're including um, pure electric vehicles. So we're just excluding the hybrids, but we're including um, pure electric vehicles. Yeah, okay, okay. So, you know, smart buildings, you know, the typical purchase price for you know, a connected thermostat or, or, you know, home energy management system will be a fraction of the spend it, in for e mobility. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So it is, you know, they're quite different products within these four categories, which go a long way, I think, to explaining the, the difference in absolute market size mm -hmm. in terms of consumer spend. Yes. Um, within the e-mobility sector, Alex, um, we did obviously cover the charging uh, technology as well. And what was the main trend, trend there in terms of, if we stripped out the cars, you know, what's the biggest growth area, I guess, in, in e-mobility outside of just the physical car itself? Um, well, the, the charge points, of course, um, as much in residential as in commercial and industrial. Um, so with the uptake of car, people are realizing that they need um, charge points. So they're installing a lot of charge points, very dynamic markets. And with it comes a variety of services, uh, such as split billing, smart charging features, um, a lot of innovation going on around that. Just looking at the, the questions coming in, Alex, there's quite a, a lot of questions. Thank you, thank you for that, everyone. I mean, e-mobility does include the charging infrastructure. There's a question from Sandrine about, you know, why are we including the vehicle in the e-mobility analysis, Alex? And I know we had this debate ourselves internally. 
Yes, um, we had this debate, and I think the reason we decided to include um, the cars is because we see them as a key entry point for many customers uh, into the new energy space. So it's very interesting for us to follow the trends in EV sales and EV uptakes and compare those to the uptake of other products and the launch of other propositions. But going forward, it might be nice to segment out the e-mobility spend between the vehicle and the infrastructure, for example. That, that's something yeah, we, that maybe we could think about. We have, we, we have done that, actually. And obviously, uh, the, the, the spend on charge points and uh, charging services is way lower than um, the one on electric vehicle sales. Hmm. Yeah. There's a, a comment from Thomas as well about thermostats. Are, are thermostats in smart buildings rather than new heating? Yes, they are. Um, it's a very good question. And again, that's something that we discussed a lot because increasingly we see connectivity being embedded in um, in uh, heating appliances. So it makes it a bit difficult, but we've decided to include, um, let's say, um, individual controls separated from the heating appliances in smart buildings uh, instead of new heating. Yeah. And James, you, you asked about the difference between the 53% overall and the 133% on mobility. 53% um, is the average of, of all of the sectors that we've looked at, Alex. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So e-mobility is the fastest growing in the last year. Yeah. Um, and go on. I was just about to say that it will probably remain so in the coming years as well. Okay, thanks. There will be a recording of the webinar. Uh, available afterwards. Um, so we are recording it and you can download the link to listen to that later. Um, the other question, Alex, I wanted there is about um, the countries that we cover. So perhaps good time to move on to the next slide and we can talk about a bit more about the distinctions between between the countries. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So we've covered uh, seven different countries that we think are the most interesting right now in Europe in terms of new energy. Um, and obviously the, the story from one country to another is quite different. Um, although we see that e-mobility represents the largest customer spent in 2020 in most countries, um, but it's not the case, for instance, in the Netherlands or in Italy. And in terms of some of the differences that we've seen, obviously we can see in the UK, it seems to be very much focused around EV, but the Netherlands has got quite a high proportion of behind the meter um, there compared to the other markets. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, yeah. So. Just briefly on the UK, I think um, the implementation of many low emission zones and many other factors around regulation and the market pool can explain why immobility is so strong uh, in this market. And looking at the Netherlands, um, this market share of behind the meter generation and storage is very much uh, linked to massive investment from the, the CNI segments actually um, in solar um, panels. And uh, we think that it was mainly induced by um, regulation, a program that is called the SD Plus uh, in the Netherlands, which allocated the 3.3 billion funds um, in 2020 to solar projects. And are there any other country differences that it's worth with highlighting? And we'll come on to the future of you, I guess, later on. Um, yeah, well, I think um, looking at heating, it's quite interesting to see that France, Spain and Italy as a, are um, quite advanced in this area. And it's quite interesting to understand why. If, for example, the price of electricity uh, plays a major role there. Um, so countries where price of electricity is rather low, like France uh, or Italy, the uptake of heat pumps uh, is actually much higher. Great, thank you. Alex, if, I mean, if you looked at this on a per capita trend, I was looking at the numbers, you know, Germany is the biggest market in terms of absolute spend, but the Dutch market, given relative to the size of the population, must be much higher, I think. Yeah, it is actually way ahead of other countries. Um, yeah, the Netherlands um, is actually quite advanced in the new energy market, and since it's it means that inhabitants um, are investing more, uh, as you say, per capita, but it's also linked to the fact that the CNI sector is very active, as I, as I mentioned.
I've just got a couple of other questions coming here again around around one of the countries, Germany. So, you know, is the behind the meter growth linked there to, to e mobility compared to, you know, is there a closer bond there between the two compared to other markets? Is the question. Um, so in Germany, the, the growth is linked to e mobility, but also to um, behind the meter generation and, and storage and new heating is um, very advanced markets in terms of um, investment in the different product area um, because electricity prices are very high and there are a lot of opportunity around innovation. So immobility is one of the trends, but um, there are also a lot going on around the, the three other product areas, I would say. But is the behind the meter storage an enabler of immobility more in, you know, is, is there a link between the two, two sectors? Not at the moment. Uh, storage is um, more linked to uh, solar PV because there is a real um, business case for self-consumption optimization in Germany. But um, storage with an electric vehicle is not really interesting at the moment. OK, great. Well, there's a couple of questions here around policy, but I think we're going to come on to that in a, in a second. So mm -hmm. we can come back to those questions. I just, yeah. Moving on, uh, one aspect of this report was to look at um, who's doing what in the markets and what are the main energy players doing. It's quite interesting to see um, in 2020 what happened. So, for instance, we've seen many utilities uh, moving down the value chain in several markets, such as heating, um, solar panels or immobility. E and this is because uh, utilities are really aiming to be closer to their customers. So we've seen several acquisition partnerships um, uh, from utilities to improve the breadth of their offers and especially in immobility. E um, auto OEMs, on the other hand, are trying to develop in-house expertise, but also partnering with utilities, for instance, but also banks, leasing company uh, to offer turnkey services to their existing customers. And we've seen a few auto OEMs starting to offer um, proposition around smart buildings, um, for instance, around smart charging, uh, V2G, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's still very nascent. Um, looking at all majors, uh, a lot of all majors uh, have been investing uh, in and acquiring tech company, hardware company, back office companies, um, especially in the immobility e space. Um, so obviously the all majors are targeting quite aggressively uh, the immobility e markets and they're aiming to build um, one-stop shop offers. I think a very good example of that is uh, Total acquiring uh, the London TPO Bluepoint or Shell investing in Drover in the UK, um, but there are many other examples. And lastly, looking at OEMs, um, so the HVAC manufacturers uh, mainly interested in offering innovative propositions around heating, smart buildings, and uh, right now their um, main objective is really to try to push the solutions um, to installers. So a lot of innovation in this area around connectivity, added value um, proposition. And lastly, battery and inverter are a little bit um, uh, late on these trends, and they're still really focusing on the infrastructure side, I would say. Um, but we are starting to see a few more innovative offers from inverter manufacturers and, and uh, um, startups focusing on battery. Great. And it's interesting to see the kind of diversity, I guess, that's emerging in the new energy market. And Andy, I might bring you in here for a bit of commentary on, on oil majors, because obviously they've got potentially deep pockets. Do you think they are going to become? bigger players or get further down the value chain towards the customer? Um, yeah, they will definitely become bigger players in, in this space. Um, and definitely, I think, around e-mobility because it just fits with their legacy business. Um, you know, the, the public charging on on street infrastructure that you need for that, you know, they have an advantage from their legacy business in terms of being able to build a, a network and a service proposition in quite a number of European countries, I think that that you know would clearly has advantage versus a a, a new entrant into the space. So e-mobility, absolutely. Um, 
the other parts of this new energy market are probably less obvious uh, for the oil majors, but um, probably harder for them to get into. But I, I think they, they probably will get into over a period of time um, because e-mobility on its own, um, I think for residential customers in particular, the propositions will probably migrate to a, uh, a proposition that manages your your charging in home as well as outside your home for example so if you're just outside the home that might be an interesting market positioning for some companies but th that market's only going to be so big um, and the vehicle could be a gateway into the home for example for oil majors who you know, typically have strong brands as well so if they can use those brands in creative ways in new ways perhaps they can build relationships with consumers uh, in the building, you know, residential consumers or, or commercial consumers um, in, in, in on the customer side of the meter. So, at the moment, Alex has got two sort of thin lines to smart buildings and behind the meter generation and storage. I think that's right, but I think those lines will get fatter over time, and I think there is potential for them to to start looking at the heating market because clearly that's a scale market, um, a huge market, which potentially is is interesting for for big corporates uh, regardless. So yes, absolutely, I do see them getting to be bigger players. Um, the extent to which they're competitors with the other companies on this slide or partners, I think is you know something that that will develop over the time. I'm, I don't necessarily think that all of these companies will, will compete with, with one another. I think there may be some interesting partnerships developing um, over the next years. Yeah, and there's some more questions as well around the kind of players that we're seeing here. So. Um, I guess, is there any other kind of standout moves or other players that we've not mentioned here that are perhaps on the fringes? Mm. Um, we've had someone ask about finance companies, um, you know, how important yeah. is the customer relationship? Like, obviously, utilities have got a first mover advantage. They've got that customer relationship with energy right now, um, but they're not always the most liked company from the customers that we speak to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I know Alex, you've done a lot of work around the connected home. I mean, the digital giants have been talked about for years as becoming big players in the energy space, the digital energy space. Um, there isn't a huge amount of evidence yet, Alex, is there for them to to really move forward on that? Yeah, no, not not really. It's true that we've started talking about uh, the GAFAM entering that market a few years ago, and in the end. Um, apart from providing a few products like Smart Thermostat, like the Google Nest, we haven't seen a big moves yet. Um, I think actually the control manufacturers, which we haven't put on that slide, um, the likes of Schneider, of Legrand, um, are actually um, more interesting to watch at the moment than, than the GAFAM. Mm. But certainly the financial players, um, insurance companies, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think they're still tinkering around the edge of this market, still not quite sure what the role, what the opportunity is for themselves. Um, you know, there have been one or two uh, initiatives and propositions. Um, you know, just recently, uh, you know, we had some discussions with a uh, FMCG group um, looking at how they can contribute to sustainability in the home. Um, you know, so I think there are consumer goods companies out there also looking into this space, but I think they're they're all at fairly early stages um, and you know, not at the moment um, you know, playing a, a significantly active role, um, but clearly there's potential for them to become more important players, I think, over the next few years. Mm -hmm. I think I would see a move away. Oh, sorry, Karen, Alex. I was just about to mention a recent research we've been doing on, on financing the energy transition. And legacy player, as Andy said, are still a bit reluctant to enter this market because it's very difficult to, to deal with um, a proposition targeting to so many individual customers. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is more and more specialized funds or other way to finance uh, the energy transition that are becoming um, um, important in Europe. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, there's a few other questions coming in, but I think we are going to cover some of this in the next slides, so I suggest we, we move on to the next next section. Yeah, there's, yes. a, there's, a, there's an interesting question about installer companies there. Uh, yeah. Benefit that we should pick up for sure. Yeah. Should, should we pick it up now then? Um, uh, you carry on, Alex, with this uh, with the presentation. Let's get through the slides and then we can make sure to come back to that. Okay. Um, so just 
a brief look at the outlook for the next five years. And uh, we believe that we will see in the next five years even more innovative proposition launches. Uh, and we uh, forecasted the customer spent on new energy products and services to grow annually by 32 percent um, in the coming years on average. And uh, we expect regulatory changes to be one of the market drivers. Um, so we had a question on, on regulation. Uh, feed-in tariffs are coming to an end or decreasing in several European countries. Um, electricity prices are, are um, going up everywhere. Uh, and uh, the need for flexibility is also increasing. So all these factors are pushing the business case for a uh, new energy proposition. And uh, we also see a growing willingness, willingness from all actors to maintain an ongoing relationship with their customers. So that leads to more servitization, more innovative solutions, um, and more push of the solutions to, to the end customer. And looking um, on a per product basis, uh, obviously we expect immobility to continue to represent the largest share um, of this market and the largest growth in the coming year. Um, so electric vehicle sales that we're uh, considering will continue to represent the bulk of the market. But we also expect uh, propositions such as fleet as a service, um, split billing to develop a lot. And we actually believe that there are key opportunities for solution providers um, in this area. Um, then the smart buildings um, product area, although much smaller in absolute value, will actually see the second highest growth rates. Um, and this is because smart propositions are seen increasingly as key to decarbonize uh, buildings, one of the priority of Europe at the moment, and uh, a useful tool to improve energy efficiency. Um, and for energy companies, it's also a very useful uh, tool to maintain an ongoing relationship with the end user and to have uh, a presence in the home or in, in the building in the case of a uh, CNI customer. Um, so new heating will be favored by several new regulations across Europe, especially in, in the new builds. Um, so we expect a lot in, of innovation around servitization, as a service, uh, heat contracts, and other added value services um, to develop in the next five years. And lastly, uh, the behind the meter solar and storage markets um, will grow a bit less. And this is because the end of fed-in tariff will negatively impact uh, several markets. Uh, but it could also make stationary storage more appealing in some cases. Thanks, Alex. There's a lot of questions here, so I'm going to try and unpick a few of these related to this this slide and the kind of our future our future view. Um, we had one question around kind of who um, is doing these activities. So as we look forward towards the next five years, you know, we've talked about OEMs, oil majors, utilities, but are they developing the solutions, or are they just kind of facilitating the market by being that middle person? If that makes sense, you know, how much are they going to be selling product versus just distributors um, of, of these these new offerings? Well, if we if we talk about all majors, I think um, in many cases, they are not really sure of their strategy yet. So it's quite um, visible that they aiming to be the provider, for instance, of e-mobility solutions. But if you look at smart buildings, we've seen all major investing a lot in smart building companies. Um, I'm thinking of Greencom Networks. I'm thinking about BP, uh, who launched their own uh, home energy management um, uh, solution. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite unclear whether or not they will be the provider of the end solution to the customer at the moment. Um, I think as the market develops and become a mass market, um, the strategy will be refined a bit. Yeah, OK. And perhaps we could pick up the installer question here as well. So in terms of barriers, I guess, to achieving this sort of growth, um, you know, are installers, particularly independent installers, engaging now, or can they be a blocker? I'm thinking especially for heat, I guess, when you've got someone going into the home and making a recommendation, could they slow down this acceleration? In many cases, the answer is yes, uh, because installers in many countries are still reluctant 
to um, push these connected and innovative solutions to the end user. But we've seen many um, strategies from energy players to actually engage with installers and uh, um, support them in offering these innovative solutions. So for instance, uh, some utilities are actually moving down the value chain and investing directly in installation companies so that they have their own workforce. Um, in more fragmented countries, for instance, Germany, um, the connectivity part uh, and the innovative um, solutions are pushed to the installers as a way to um, become more competitive, actually. Um, and um, we've seen also a lot of uh, HVAC manufacturers in particular offering solutions for free to the installer just to convince them of the added value of the service. So lots of uh, solutions to actually overcome the, the reluctance of some installers in some markets. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think the installer uh, part of the value chain is becoming a really interesting part of, of business actually and it's being increasingly recognized as a competitive advantage to have your own uh, in, installer capability you know your own access to your own field force because fundamentally a lot of these propositions involve a technician going into a building to do some installation and if you have that within your control then it creates perhaps efficiency you know op opex reduction in your business but also clearly creates the potential to do cross-sell or upsell with customers through your own installer force. So, and I think a really interesting proof point of that is, is there seems to be a number of recent startups around the installer activity across Europe. You know, entrepreneurs are looking to create new approaches to provision of installation services uh, to the industry, uh, which might be sort of multi-trade installation platforms, essentially. But you can definitely see there's in investor, private investor interest in that part of the, the market at the moment, and it's becoming quite active. Thanks, Andy. Um, we are just keeping an eye on time. We've got a few questions here around um, as a service type offers. So perhaps if we move on to the next slides, because we do come to the, the kind of questions from the audience that we had in advance. Yeah, so maybe we can cover the first question and then we'll move on to as a service. Um, because the first question we had was around what energy companies are doing to affect consumer behavior to adopt new products and services. So obviously a lot is going on and we have a lot of examples from our um, database that lists more than 400 companies. So a lot of example. And the fact is that yes, the typical energy customer remains relatively disengaged, I would say. Uh, customers are not really interested or aware of energy and energy technology in most cases. Um, they are quite risk adverse, not willing to pay for what they consider either unnecessary or unproven. And so we see three uh, basic strategy uh, being taken by uh, energy companies. Um, Andy, maybe you want to, to elaborate on, on these strategies. Um, yeah, so there's sort of three basic strategies. I mean, this is drawing on our Energy Insights Plus research uh, from our colleague uh, David Chatefkik. There's a there's a there's a link to that research if you're interested. Look at that. But there's sort of three basic strategies. One is is to engage with customers to um, give them some information that allows them to understand uh, how their behaviour affects their energy bill in particular. Um, the second is to give them propositions that allow them to do something about reducing that energy bill, um, which could be related to energy efficiency um, measures they might take or provision of advice to them to nudge their behavior in certain directions. And then the third step would be the sort of collaborate business models, which are much more about the sort of partnership approach of, of you know, for example, customers giving access to to their devices in, in the home for you know, remote uh, diagnostics or, or remote control in terms of you know, participating in a VPP, for example. Um, you know, engage is broadly where the market has been and is at. Um, increasingly, the propositions in the market are empowering customers to do something. And you know, certainly the future is in the direction of, of much more collaborative relationships between the providers and uh, and end use customers. So that that would that's our simple model to to characterize this market. But clearly, the direction of travel here is to um, for companies to earn the trust of customers, and through that trust, 
to be able to influence their behavior. And on the right hand side, Alex, on the slide here, you've put a few examples of, of the things that we see in our business model database of, of companies bringing propositions to market um, that are, are, are trying to achieve these, these types of uh, basic strategy. Yeah, absolutely. So a, a lot of way to apply this, these three strategies, developing the brand of proposition, offering bundles. Um, so we've seen a lot of companies, um, as you said, in the offering, um, add-on products, so I'm thinking about Eon or NG, who both companies offering boilers uh, with uh, Tado Smart Thermostat, so it's a great way to engage uh, with uh, the customer and, and uh, open the door for future collaboration with them. I mean, the, the big opportunity here is coming through digitalization, so connected devices is leading to availability of data that's never previously been available and using that data in creative and innovative ways is is the opportunity here um, and you know ultimately that will help um, engage with customers and, and influence their behavior so you know that's a really exciting part of the energy market right now i think i think from from david's research as well it's you know it's starting off small so we've seen quite a lot of things that seem reasonably insignificant you know small offers around you know fault detection for example um which have a real customer benefit um but aren't you know high billing, but it's a, a first step on kind of engaging and then empowering your customer. Um, so eventually that you'll get them on that path towards their own their own energy transition, I guess, so that they ready to become ready to collaborate. Um, we are running out of time, so it'd be good to yeah to talk about um, as a service, I guess, in relation to this slide, Alex. Yeah. Um, so this question: Have you found any change of business model since last year? Um, so Business models don't really change in one year, but for the past years, um, I would say we've seen important activities in the refinement of business model and um, especially around heating services with a digital component, as Andy just said, uh, more recently around fleet and company proposition, uh, company car proposition, and around self-consumption optimization. And also we've seen a big trend um, around servitization and especially um, launches of as a service uh, propositions in several different areas with different technologies covered uh, offered to uh, cni customers but also residential customers and um, um, we've identified two type of models the first one being the, the scale dependent models um, targeting uh, big uh, pool of customers and expert dependent models that is uh, more using um, high level of IP and um, innovative solutions to offer um, solutions to a more reduced um, customer target. And in terms of the as a service, we did have a question earlier on. Let me just scroll back and find it. Thanks for everyone's questions. It's been a really engaged audience today. Um, there's a question around, you know, regulatory barriers, I guess, to, to these kind of as a service models. Are we seeing any movement on that in, in particular markets? Um, I mean, it depends very much on, on the country we're talking about, but it's true that in many markets, um, the way that contracts can be uh, put together um, prevent companies to, for example, um, have a contract involving product sale or product leasing with energy provision. So it could be considered as an obstacle, but what we're seeing is that most companies actually manage to go around that, either by offering um, separate contracts for one um, offer, which um, increases a little bit the complexity, but still um, enables them to offer as a service. We had a question earlier as well about fleet as a service. So we had that kind of on one of the slides as being a, a kind of growth growth area. Just briefly, you know, fleet as a service is that, you know, what does that cover? Um, well, it pretty much covers uh, business um, cars uh, being gathered as fleet either for pro professional use or even uh, for um, just a fleet of uh, employees' car. And with we're thinking that there are a lot of opportunities there because uh, companies will have to manage uh, cars being used for different um, um, reasons. So I just mentioned employees and versus. Um, versus professional use and uh, it means that everything around charging but also billing um, 
congestion management will become uh, very important for these companies. And in general, managing a fleet is not their core activity. So having someone um, uh, able to provide all the, the tools and, um, and uh, the management um, solution uh, to make this uh, seamless and uh, uh, easy for them is, is going to be key, I think. Okay. And then linked into this, we've had a question around tariffs, and I think it's probably too big to answer with the time we have left. But um, obviously, as we see this electrification continue across Europe, it's going to be important to have the right tariffs to enable flexibility, demand response, the right contracts in place. Um, this is going to be something that we're looking at in, in future in the business model service? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at it uh, as part of many of, uh, of our reports because it can be uh, an enabler of other energy propositions or the other way around because of the uptake of certain technology it becomes quite interesting. Um, so we've seen big evolution in tariff this year. Uh, we've seen the launch of uh, dynamic time of use tariff in several countries. Uh, we've also seen uh, talks about um, capacity grid tariff, which are very interesting. Um, so we'll be in, we will be uh, following that closely and uh, what it induces for the, the energy transition. And of course, the uh, kind of provision of platforms as enablers as well is becoming a really hot topic across a number of our different services. You know, understanding which platforms and who will use them and how they're going to, you know, link everything together is going to be quite critical as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Andy, have you got any final questions you want to cover off? Um, nothing, actually. I'm just conscious of time and I know people probably yeah. <laughs> need to get on. So I think we'd, let's uh, skip the last uh, question. I think we've taken lots of questions all the way through um, and there's many that we haven't answered. So uh, we will try and review the questions after the webinar and uh, perhaps we'll try and come back to as many people as we can on their questions. Thank you everyone for all your questions. It's, it's great to see that um, the, the interest in, in this research and the, the topics we presented here about. There's, there's lots of questions that we you know, could have gone into but we didn't have time to. Um, you know, for subscribers, just to repeat, you know, you have access to all of the data and the detailed breakdowns on, on the forecasts in the uh, report and the data that's on the subscription website. So please do log into that um, and non-subscribers you can visit the uh, the public web page there um, to get more information or indeed you know contact uh, Alex, uh, Jennifer or myself um, be happy to talk to you directly about that um, but otherwise I think we should uh, perhaps uh, end it here because we've just run over the 45 minutes now. Great thanks and thanks everyone for your engagement and as Andy said we'll come back to as many of you as we can um, after the webinar with more detailed responses. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Yeah, thanks everyone for your time and uh, feel Thank free you. to get in touch with us if you'd like to discuss. Bye now. Bye-bye.